Good morning, and uh, welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webinar is part of ACM's commitment to a lifelong learning and serving the over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM members. I am uh, Reno Xing, a co-founder of Databricks and a com committee on the app. Apache Spark project. At Databricks, I oversee technical directions for Spark engineering. And before Databricks, I was a PhD student at the UC Berkeley AMP lab, so I've been working with Matei for a while. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the uh, ACM, um, or what it has to offer, ACM recognized the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. So before we start, I would like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slides in front of you. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of widgets and resources, including a closed caption widget. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or audio, press F5 key in Windows or Command plus R key um, if you're on the Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device, or re close and relaunch your presentation. To control the volume, um, adjust the master volume on your computer at the end of the presentation. We will have time for questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time and click on the Submit button. And now see and moderate it. The session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it is available and check learning.acm.org in a few days for updates. So you can also use Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation links with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag ACM Learning. We'll be watching for your tweets. Um, so without further ado, today's presentation is uh, Making Big Data Processing Simple with Spark by Matei Zaharia. Uh, Matei's been a longtime friend. We worked together at UC Berkeley AmLab and uh, also started Databricks together. He's now a system professor of computer science at MIT and a CTO of Databricks. Um, the company is commercializing Apache Spark. He started the Spark project during his PhD work at UC Berkeley, and Matei is broadly interested in large-scale computer systems and networks, and also contributed to many open source projects, including Mesos, Hadoop, Tachyon, and Shark. He received the ACM Best um, Doctoral Dissertation Award in 2014 for his research. Um, largely on Spark, as well as Best Paper Awards at NSDI and SICOM. Um, so, Matei, we look forward to your uh, presentation here today. Okay, thanks, Reynolds. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks uh, everyone for joining us um, on the stream today. Um, so, in this talk, I'm going to give uh, uh, just sort of a brief uh, overview of uh, the Spark uh, project and the Spark programming model uh, and sort of the research that led to that. And uh, it's meant for uh, more basically a general audience, so it d doesn't assume that you know too much about other big data processing tools, but it's just meant to show you how, you know, just um, how, how you might be able to use this kind of system. Um, so let's start with uh, what is uh, Apache Spark. So Spark is a um, cluster computing engine that generalizes the MapReduce programming model uh, that Google introduced back in 2004. And uh, basically it, it, it tries to support more types of applications and to make them easier to program than MapReduce does. And the goal is to make it uh, both easy and fast to process large data sets, uh, you know, on a cluster of machines. And uh, to Two things that um, you know that to, that Spark um, provides to do this. Um, first of all, it provides a very high-level APIs in languages such as Java, Scala, Python, and R uh, that are easy to program in. You know, try to make it as similar as possible to programming on a single machine when that's possible. Um, and second, um, it's a unified engine that can capture many different uh, workloads on the same engine. So you don't have to um, use, you know, hook together many different systems to create a pipeline. You can actually express them all in the same programming model. And that's very powerful to get both uh, faster and, uh, and easier to use um, uh, sort of um, uh, processing. Um, so, uh, 
in in terms of the unified engine, uh, what that means is that on top of the Spark engine, uh, there's a wide variety of standard libraries that are built in. And these are the four that ship with the project. Um, so there's Spark SQL, which lets you work with structured data and use languages like SQL or um, other APIs as well uh, to, 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 to query this kind of data. Um, there's Spark Streaming, which uh, uses the engine to process and update uh, results in real time as new data comes in. Um, there's MLlib, a library of distributed machine learning algorithms that you know the the project developers built and you can just call into. Um, and there's Graphics, which is a system um, for graph applications. And the nice thing um, about these is that they're all just libraries you can combine together in one program, and they all translate down to the same engine underneath. So it's very easy to make an application that combines several of these things. And uh, beyond sort of the, uh, you know, the code and, and the features in the project, Spark is also um, a large and, and still a fast growing community. Um, so this graph here just shows the, the growth of the developer uh, community over time. This is people contributing patches to Spark. And you can see in, in the last year, we've gone up to uh, over 100 people per month contributing uh, to the project. Uh, and actually, just a few weeks ago, we hit uh, 1,000 developers total since the beginning of the project, uh, which was back in 2010. Um, so the community has grown really quickly. It's a very active community with a lot of new things coming out, you know, every few months in, in, in each Spark release. And actually, uh, among the open source projects out there, uh, Spark currently has the most active community. So the more people contributing to it than to any other project for uh, big data. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to go through uh, four sort of sections. Uh, first, I'll talk about why we wanted to design a unified engine. This is the part that, especially from the research side, was uh, was pretty unique about Spark. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to explain why we did that and what are the benefits of that. Um, and then I'll talk uh, in more detail about the Spark programming model and how you'd actually use um, the system to do things. Um, I'll talk a little about some of the libraries that are built in, and then I'll talk about applications. What are people actually using it for? And so I'm going to start with this one. So um, to, to understand why, uh, you know, why we um, uh, wanted a unified engine, um, I'll start with uh, sort of the history of, of large-scale um, cluster computing. And um, a lot of the, the recent wave in, in data-intensive computing uh, started back in 2004 with the MapReduce paper published by Google. And Google in this paper said, well, we have this environment that's that's pretty uh, unique, which is a large number of commodity servers. It's data intensive computation as opposed to just compute intensive, which, it, which is what uh, scientific um, uh, sort of um, supercomputing was. Um, and uh, it, you know, it, it automatically deals with failures and it keeps going and it's easy for users to write applications in. Uh, and that was the MapReduce uh, paper that was extremely influential. Um, one thing you uh, you may notice in the MapReduce paper, uh, though that that uh, you know that was a very important part of it, is uh, they talked a lot about how general it was. So they really liked the idea of having a a, a general engine to do these different batch processing tasks they had. Um, so they said, you know, we first wrote MapReduce in 2003, and since that time, we've been pleasantly surprised at how broadly applicable it was. Uh, and basically, they list a whole lot of applications inside Google that people wrote in MapReduce and were able to run, uh, you know, at large scale much more easily than building uh, their own custom code. So that was a very important piece, is, is the generality of it. Uh, but MapReduce itself uh, only handled batch processing, which you know was fine for them because that's the main thing they did at the time. So what happened after that is uh, MapReduce became uh, you know very widely deployed, especially through the Hadoop uh, implementation, which was an open source uh, MapReduce from Apache, and. Um, uh, you know, it, it was very good for batch processing, but users quickly wanted to do more things on the same kind of hardware and at the same kind of scale that they were using MapReduce on. Um, so they wanted to do three types of things. This is what we saw talking to early users. 
first of all, they wanted to do more complex multi-pass algorithms. MapReduce is just a single pass computation. Uh, you do a map through the data, then you do a, a reduce, and you can you know, aggregate together some values. Um, but many real-world algorithms need to go through the data many times, and uh, basically they, they weren't that easy or efficient to build with MapReduce. Uh, the second thing people wanted to do is more interactive ad hoc ways. So, for example, you're collecting a large data set, you know, maybe um, maybe something about uh, visits to a website or maybe a scientific data set or something like, you know, uh, testing out, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals or something like that. And uh, you can run a batch job over it and, and compute a result um, in like um, 30 minutes and, and aggregate together all the data. That's really great. But then... If you have a new question about it, you know, you, you want to ask that question and get back the results in a few seconds if possible so that you can actually explore it interactively. And that's a thing that MapReduce wasn't able to do. And um, finally, um, users wanted to do more real-time stream processing as well. So instead of, for example, building a web index every night and updating it, you know, once uh, once per night in this way, um, why can't you uh, update it in real time as as you browse, as you um, uh, you know call the web, and as you see new new events happening or news articles appear or stuff like that? So it's a very natural question in in all of these um, environments. And because of um, these different workloads, the result was that, um, you know, the, the per people uh, proposed a wide variety of specialized cluster computing systems for these workloads that are, you know, sort of the equivalent of MapReduce for streaming or the equivalent of MapReduce for interactive queries or things like that. And that's kind of the direction that the software went into. So um, this slide here shows some of the systems that are available today. So basically, we started out with MapReduce that did batch processing, but it was a general engine. You could do many different types of batch processing, which was good. Um, and then um, we got all these specialized systems, uh, uh, including inside Google and also outside it. So in Google, for example, they developed a Pregel and Dremel, which are, uh, were systems for graph processing and interactive queries, respectively. Uh, in the open source Hadoop ecosystem, there are also a lot of open source uh, projects with uh, you know, interesting names like Giraffe, uh, Impala, Presto, Drill, Storm, and so on, that do different things. You know, Some of them are graph processing, some of them are uh, interactive SQL, some of them are streaming, and so on. And today, you, know, you, you just see that there's a ton of these systems out there, and um, you know, you, people often use some kind of combination of them. So with specialized systems, uh, you know, even though they solve the individual problems uh, that, that they tackle, there, there are also some challenges with having them. And basically, we saw two challenges. The first one is if you if you have a lot of specialized systems uh, that you need to, to hook together, you know, to build an application, it's a lot of different pieces of software to manage, uh, to tune and configure, to deploy, to upgrade, and so on. So it's just a lot of operational overhead. You need to be an expert not just in one thing, but in um, you know all of these different systems, which have their own kind of quirks as to how they run. And the second thing that's more fundamental is that um, you can't easily combine different types of processing. Um, and that's a problem because most big data applications actually need to do that. They need to combine many different processing steps to actually clean up the data um, and bring it into a form that you can do interesting analytics on and then maybe serve the result or apply it to something in real time. So as a really simple example, um, you might collect a bunch of data and then you may want to load a subset of the data with um, SQL um, and then run a machine learning algorithm on the result. And with the uh, systems I showed on the previous slide, that would be two different systems. And you need to figure out, okay, well, how do I load, how do I run SQL in one of them? How do I export it into a format that the second one can read? How do I then query it? Um, it's both uh, difficult to, to, to use as a user and it's also inefficient because you need to move the data between these systems all the time.
So in many cases, actually, if you measure what the computation is doing, um, the cost to transfer the data between these two engines is as expensive as the computation itself. And uh, so basically, this really slows down applications. And the reason why is, you know, big data is expensive to move around. It's, it's expensive to copy it across the network. It's expensive... Uh, to write it to disk or to change the file format or any of that stuff. And often it's as expensive as actually running your algorithm on that. So, um, so this is a non-trivial cost. So basically the question, you know, we posed was, um, can we go, you know, out of this world of, of specialized systems and back to a single kind of general system that just captures these new workloads that motivated the previous ones? And that's what we tried to do with Spark. We tried to design a unified engine in a way that, you know, we know can systematically capture these different applications. Okay, so what is, you know, how, how does Spark do this? How does it actually work? Um, so, to, you know, to, to start with, uh, basically, um, we're going to look at what these new applications had in common. And at first, the applications look very different, but they actually have the same kind of thing in common. So remember, there were three things we wanted to do. Uh, more complex multipass algorithms, interactive ad hoc queries, and real-time stream processing. And it turns out all of these things really need one, um, uh, you know, one feature that MapReduce lacks, which is more efficient data sharing. They're all applications where you go, um, you know, uh, over a subset of the data many times, or you update the result, uh, you know, you, you um, over time as as new uh, data comes in. So they're both cases where you have kind of a, a very hot working set of data, um, and uh, you need to share it effectively across many computation steps. And MapReduce didn't have this. MapReduce just had parallel operations you had on the data, but no way to, to do uh, data sharing across multiple um, of these steps. So let's take a look at that a little more concretely. Um, so here's a couple of um, examples of running things on MapReduce. Um, the first one at the top is if, if you want to run an iterative algorithm, so uh, algorithm uh, that goes through the data multiple times. So what you do is with MapReduce is um, you'd start with some input data in a distributed file system like HDFS, the Hadoop distributed file system, and then you'd read it into a MapReduce job, that's the blue box, iteration one, and then uh, that job has to write the result back out to a file system because from its point of view, you know, it's finished. All it does is, is compute something and write it back out. Um, and once you've done doing that, um, you go ahead and you immediately read it into the next job, which is another MapReduce, and you write it out again and so on. So between every pair of jobs, you have to go through this, uh, you know, distributed, replicated file system to actually save the data, to share it between the jobs. And that's pretty inefficient. Uh, in the picture at the bottom, I'm showing interactive queries, and um, that has a similar problem. So you, you have your data in this uh, distributed file system, and then each query has to read it from there, parse it, you know, and figure out the result for that query. And all of them have to go back to the source data. There's no way to share stuff if you had some, some kind of intermediate result or common processing between the queries. So doing this using MapReduce and using just the file system as, as data sharing is slow, um, mostly due to replication uh, of data across the network and disk I.O. Every time you write a result, it needs to be sent across the network to many machines, and, um, and you need to do disk I.O. To, to actually store it reliably. So the thing we wanted to have is a way to, to make this intermediate sharing much faster. And um, we do it by, um, by um, replacing the sharing with uh, uh, just in-memory sharing. So we, we keep the data in memory in the same process and let you run different computations on it. Um, and we also do it by changing the, the fault tolerance mechanism so that we don't have to replicate the data or save it to disk. So we can actually do the sharing at the speed of memory instead of at the speed of a uh, distributed file system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And uh, why does this help? Well, sharing data and memory within the same machine um, is easily 10 to 100 times faster than the network or the disk. So if your computation can keep up with that, um, you, you'll get a significant speed up from actually sharing it this way.
So that's what we wanted to enable. Um, and the the way we enable that in, in the programming model is it's a, a pretty um, simple programming model. Um, it's based on just building these distributed data sets, and you can control where they are stored. So the the main idea you work with in Spark is called resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. And these are um, collections of objects, like imagine just Java objects or Python objects, that you can store in memory or on disk across a cluster. And uh, you can share each RDD. You can use it in many different um, uh, operations whenever you want. Um, and they have a few uh, interesting properties. So uh, first of all, uh, they're created using parallel transformations on, on other data sets, uh, such as map and filter. So all the operations you use to build RDDs are parallel, and you know that's why we can automatically spread out the work across many machines. Um, and they're also automatically rebuilt on failure, so the system itself handles how to recover this if um, if a node crashes, and um, you don't need to worry about uh, uh, nodes failing in the middle of your computation. So. Um, Here's what um, the programming model actually looks like. I'm going to show uh, some examples in, in Python. And uh, this is actually code you could just type into the Python shell. You can, you can just use Spark you know, from the Python shell sort of interactively. Or you can type it into a standalone program and, and actually like write a job that does this. Um, so in this example, we're going to have uh, log mining. We're going to have a um, log file. Uh, in a distributed file system, and we're going to load just the error messages from it into memory, and then search for different patterns in it. And here's how uh, you do that using Spark. Um, so first of all, um, I'm going to show the, the cluster of machines we have. Um, we have a driver, which is sort of the, the master, uh, where you're uh, sending commands. And we have a bunch of workers that will hold the data and do computation. And the first thing you do is you type, uh, you know, Python code, which is um, spark.txt file. Um, so um, you say, okay, I'm going to have a data set uh, called lines, which is a text file sitting in the Hadoop distributed file system. You don't have to use the Hadoop file system. You can use a whole bunch of other storage uh, systems as well, but I'm just going to show this one here. And this gives us a base uh, RDD, or a distributed data set, of strings. And it's going to be, uh, by default, one uh, string for each line of text in the file. So think of this as a big distributed uh, collection of strings that are, you know, that, that are sitting uh, you know, in, in this file. And once you have that, you can do transformations on it. Um, so for example, we want to filter out the lines that start with error. And the way we do that in, in Python is we, uh, we just say lines.filter, and we pass it a Python function. So this here is a lambda function. That's a way to just define a function in line. Um, and it's just going to see if the string starts with error. If you want to write a longer function, you can just write a function and then put in its name here. And Spark automatically takes this function and all the values it depends on and sends it to the cluster and runs it in parallel across a bunch of nodes. Um, so that's, uh, that's you know, what it does for you. You just have to write this function. And this gives us back a transformed data set, or RDD, which we called errors here, which is just the lines that contain, uh, that start with error. And if we want, we can do more transformations as well. Um, so for example, maybe these are tab-separated fields, and we want to pull out just the error message, which is field number two. So we can do that with a map function. Uh, given a line uh, S, we split it by tabs, and we pull out field number two. And we get a new RDD of messages. And you can see how you, know, you can chain together a bunch of these to, to create a computation. Um, and finally, um, you can tell Spark which uh, data sets to cache uh, in memory, so which ones you want to share efficiently and which ones not to. So in this case, we don't want to load all of the lines of text uh, into memory. That's maybe too many. But we do want to load the error messages because we'll be doing a lot of queries on those. And we do that using messages.cache. OK, so that's, that's how we define you know, and, and, and um, uh, save these data sets. 
Um, so what what actually executes? So it turns out actually until this point, like when we ran this, uh, nothing's actually executed on the cluster. Um, Spark actually evaluates um, all these operations lazily. So it waits until you put together a bunch of operations and then it figures out how to actually compute something. And uh, we're going to do that here by actually running a query on, on this data. Um, so we're going to say, say we're going to count how many of these error messages contain MySQL. So count is a different type of operation called an action in Spark, which actually kicks out a parallel computation. All the previous ones just give us a new RDD uh, without uh, immediately computing it. Um, so when Spark sees this, it's going to look at all the steps you did before, the map and filter and so on, and it's going to come up with a plan for how to run this. And uh, what it will do is uh, it will start with, okay, where is the file located on the cluster? The HDFS file is split into blocks on different nodes, um, and it will send tasks to each node to process that. Uh, and those guys will do the, the map and the filter, and they'll send us back some results um, you know, with, with these counts. And each worker is also going to save uh, cache with all the cached um, uh, uh, data sets it, it built along the way. So all the partitions of messages that it computed, it's going to remember those in case you want to query messages again, because we asked it to do that. So next time, so now you get back a result, and next time you have a query, you know, maybe MySQL wasn't the problem in this case, uh, maybe it's actually Redis, um, you can run a similar kind of query, and Spark will know that the message data is cached already, and it will just read that from the cache and send you back results. So uh, it doesn't need to go back and, and recompute everything from the beginning. And basically, you know, once you have this, you can run lots of other queries as well and just work with these error messages and figure out what's going wrong. So, um, what, uh, you know, what is the impact of this on performance? So just to give you a sense of what you can do, um, one of the demos we do is full text search of, of Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is not super huge, but it's around 60 gigabytes of data. It's not a thing you can really work with interactively um, on just your laptop. Um, but if you just put it on a small, like, 10-node um, Spark cluster and, um, and run queries this way, you can just do full text search of it in about half a second. You know, anything you want to type in Python, just to run it on all of Wikipedia in half a second. And um, if you do it with on-disk data instead of using the in-memory cache, it takes about 20 seconds. So there's a significant benefit from actually being able to share this um, data in memory, and you can use this API very interactively to work with data. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a sense of what it's like for a programmer. Again, this is you know high-level API um, stuff I talked about, which is you know it's very easy to just um, create a computation out of these different operations and just run it. Um, the other cool thing that happens underneath the API is fault tolerance, and um, I'll talk uh, just a little bit about that. This is also one of the things that's in the uh, that's in, uh, described in more detail in the research papers. Um, so I remember I said at the beginning that we don't want to replicate data across the network, and we don't want to save it to disk because that's really slow. So how do we then provide fault tolerance, uh, you know, when, when we're hunting on these large clusters? Uh, the way Spark does that is a, a, a concept called lineage, um, which is Spark remembers the chain of operations that we used to build each record of data, and it can use those to recompute just the missing data when something fails. So here's another example of a computation. It's a slightly uh, more complicated one. So we have a file with a bunch of records, and we want to count uh, the records uh, with different types, and uh, um, then we want to filter out some of these. So basically, we're going to map each record to record.type as the key and one as the value. Uh, then we'll do reduce by key. This is to sum up the ones for each type. So this gives us the, the total number of records with each record type. And then we're going to filter out, we want to figure out record types uh, uh, that had count bigger than 10. So it's, uh, you know, this is what we're doing here. And uh, the way the, the computation graph looks uh, is shown below. So we start with an input file, which you know, we split up into some partitions. We did a map to compute a result on each one. We did a reduce. In that, we had to group the data by key, so we had to move it across uh, machines maybe. Uh, you know. And uh, then we did a filter, which is local on each machine. 
Um, so what happens now if, if part of the computation fails? So if any part of this graph um, goes missing, um, Spark will look at it and will use this graph structure to recompute just the missing pieces. So in this case, we lost a piece of the reduced result and a piece of the filter. And Spark is going to take you know, the previous output and just reconstruct this subset of the graph. Um, and um, the, one of the cool things is if a, a bigger subset of the graph was missing, a lot of the time, even the recovery work can be done in parallel. So you can just split that up among the, the nodes that are still up and uh, very quickly compute just what was missing. And so the cool thing with this is um, you always you get back the, the same result. And as a programmer, you don't need to worry about how to recover. And at the same time, we don't need to replicate data either. So it's it's much faster. If nothing fails, it's um, you know it's the same as just writing it to memory and just running over it without having to do anything at all for fault tolerance. Okay. So I showed the, you know, I showed a simple example before. Um, the this ability to do fast data sharing also helps in a, a lot of other applications. So here's the one other one, which is an iterative algorithm. Um, it's a machine learning algorithm called logistic regression, and this is just one one example of like why data sharing matters. So this is an algorithm that runs a bunch of iterations to compute, um, uh, you know, basically uh, to, to to try to classify data, and um, the more iterations you run, the better the answer gets. So you usually want to run a lot of iterations. And uh, here we implemented this in, in Hadoop MapReduce and in Spark. And basically you can see the first iteration in both systems takes roughly the same amount of time, around 100 seconds, mostly because it's loading the data from disk. And then later iterations um, in, in Hadoop, they take the same because there's no data sharing. In Spark, they take only about one second. And so you can run lots of iterations you know, in the time it would have taken Hadoop to just do one or two of them um, and get a better result faster. And this is typical of a lot of algorithms. The computing you do per record is um, so much less expensive than loading the record from disk that you really want to optimize data sharing to actually run this at its full potential. And um, final thing I'll put, just because it's cool, actually Reynolds was uh, heavily involved in this, um, is uh, is on disk performance. So being able to share data and memory is really nice, uh, but of course not all data sets fit in memory. And uh, we've also optimized Spark pretty heavily uh, to, to work well on disk. Um, and actually even for a single step of MapReduce, uh, it's actually a pretty fast uh, engine. So one of the things we did in um, uh, last year is uh, we entered the the um, large-scale um, sorting competition. Uh, this is uh, the gray sort competition. Um, it's a contest where you need to sort 100 terabytes of data as quickly as possible. You can use whatever hardware you want, whatever software you want, however many machines you want. And um, uh, the previous record holder for this um, was Hadoop, uh, and uh, which, which was used on 2,000 machines to sort 100 terabytes of data in 72 minutes. So that's, uh, you know, I mean, th that's just, uh, the, you know, a large cluster of machines crunching away and sorting this. And uh, using Spark last year, we were able to actually beat this record using just 200 machines. Um, and we were able to sort uh, 100 terabytes in 23 minutes. And the main reason for this is basically more efficient use of the hardware. So we optimize the network stack to work well with you know, many connections to many nodes at once. We optimize disk IO to, uh, you know, to be fast when you're reading from multiple disks and to transfer data in chunks that are as large as possible and so on. And uh, we're able to get very good performance even for, um, uh, you know, even for uh, purely on disk computations. Okay. So final uh, little bit I wanted to uh, to go through uh, on, on just what's in the project is a little bit um, about the libraries. Um, so as I said, you know, uh, we really wanted to, to make a general engine, and uh, a lot of the activity in the open source project is now in these libraries. So we have SQL, streaming, machine learning, and graph. And all these libraries follow the same uh, kind of philosophy as the core API. They want to have um, a very high level APIs that you can easily combine to build up a computation. Um, so here's an example, of, you know, a slightly simplified example of uh, what you can do with the libraries. 
So you can load some data using SQL. So for example, if you have a structured data table in a database somewhere, you can just use a SQL expression to pull out the fields uh, that you want. Um, and then you can run a machine learning model on it using our ML library. So you can run k-means, for example, to train a model. And then you can apply that model to a stream. So in this case, um, we took some tweets, we cluster them by latitude and longitude, and then um, you, we take new tweets from the Twitter stream and we predict for each one which cluster it's part of, and then we count how many tweets came in from each cluster. So it's very easy to take uh, data and to take uh, you know objects in these different libraries and combine them and just have a single program that combines these different processing modes. Um, and that's that's the thing we're going for in the API is you know same way that you can easily combine libraries uh, for small data on a single machine. We want the same for uh, distributed processing of big data. And uh, the nice thing with combining these is, is not just the usability, but also performance. So if you had separate systems to do these different things, um, like for example, loading the data, uh, training, and then querying, uh, each system would need to store the data somewhere to some kind of storage um, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure to share it with the next one. So something like HDFS. And as I talked about before, uh, for many uh, algorithms, reading and writing the data is much more expensive than just running the algorithm itself. So your whole your pipeline would be spending lots of time reading and writing data from HDFS. Um, and with Spark, you can uh, combine these two uh, these these different steps into one program and just have to read and write the data once and do all the other data sharing in memory. So you get uh, you know not just convenience, but the the pipeline can also be quite a bit faster. And uh, it turns out that even if you look at individual steps like just SQL or just machine learning, um, on the Spark engine with the libraries we wrote, we're able to get um, uh, very good performance uh, matching sort of the specialized systems for that. So even if you're doing that, uh, you get pretty good performance. And this graph here just shows a, a few different applications, uh, SQL, streaming, and, and machine learning, just a few benchmarks where we compare Spark against some uh, specialized systems for that, such as uh, GraphLab for machine learning or um, Impala for uh, uh, for SQL. And basically, in a lot of cases, we're able to match the performance of these. And the reason is, you know, inside the functions you pass to Spark, like the map functions and filter and so on, you can use a lot of the techniques these do. You can use, uh, you know, column-oriented processing. You can use uh, interesting, uh, like, highly optimized matrix libraries to do machine learning and so on. So we've, you know, this is... There's nothing stopping you basically from uh, getting very good performance uh, with these. And we're trying to build a stack of libraries where you just get that out of the box for a lot of common applications. And there's quite a bit more to say uh, about the libraries, but um, uh, you know I'm, I'm not going to go into into them in, in that much detail here. But the libraries are really the most active part of Spark, and uh, a lot of the activity recently has been to make the libraries um, even closer and even more familiar to uh, single machine tools. So uh, this year, in particular, we had three um, large additions that came out. Um, we have a data frame API. Uh, data frames are a concept in R and in Python through this library is called Pandas. Uh, that's very commonly used for uh, data science and just for working with structured data. So they're a really easy API to work with structured data, you know, pull out specific columns, um, aggregate them, and so on. And with Spark, we take the same API and we parallelize it over a cluster. So um, you can write codes very similar to what you do in R on a single machine and have it run in parallel. And this has become a very popular way to use Spark, especially for the data science uh, kind of use case. Um, we have uh, our interface uh, that came out this year that integrates with R's uh, formulas and with uh, with the data frames that are built into R. So it it looks similar to working um, with R on a single machine. 
And we also have a machine learning pipeline API similar to scikit-learn that lets you hook together a pipeline of steps like I talked about before and train all of it at once and tune it and so on. And the cool thing with these is, you know, we're basically, we're, uh, we're trying to um, make the distributed tools uh, for, for working with data very similar to popular single node tools. And in many cases, we can actually match the same API and just do the distribution underneath it. And it, it's really nice if you're already familiar with an existing one. Okay, so that's, you know, that was basically, um, uh, you know, what is the programming model and what are some of the libraries, and hopefully it's given you a sense of, uh, you know, what we're trying to do with uh, with Spark. I'll have a bunch of links at the end with, you know, more details if you actually want to try it out yourself. Um, and the final thing I wanted to, to talk about is um, applications or what are people using Spark for, uh, which I, I'm sure um, a lot of people are interested in. Um, and especially because, you know, it, it tries to be a very general engine, um, we see a wide variety of applications. So what are really the most common ones? So since uh, Spark came out in, in 2010, um, the, the user community has grown a lot. And um, over the past, uh, you know, basically in, in the past year at Databricks, you know, we've been um, surveying uh, users uh, and, uh, you know, trying to see what, you know, what, what are the common use cases. And we've counted over a thousand uh, production deployments. And the largest Spark clusters that, uh, you know, users have talked about publicly are um, as large as 8,000 nodes. Um, so, um, you know, th th there are many, you know, smaller clusters out there as well. Um, and this um, uh, set of logos here just shows some of the companies that have spoken uh, publicly about how they use Spark. Uh, most of these presented at the Spark Summit, which is a community conference. And you can actually find talks from many of them online at sparksummit.org saying exactly, you know, what they're doing with it. But you can see it, it, it's, a, it's a fairly wide variety of um, industries, both sort of web companies uh, and um, other types of businesses that, uh, you know, that work with large data sets. Um, so what are actually the top applications? Uh, this is what, uh, you know, what we found. Um, so um, uh, business intelligence and data warehousing are actually some of the most common. Uh, this just means, you know, collecting large data sets, um, often a mix of structured and unstructured data, and being able to run reports on it or run interactive queries uh, to, to actually, uh, you know, ask questions about the business. So these are very common. Um, on the machine learning side, recommendation is a very popular use case of 44% uh, of, of um, organizations were, um, you know, were using it for that. Um, log processing is also very common, as I've shown. Um, uh, you know, this can be used for different things. Um, User-facing services um, and fraud detection and security are a few other ones. So these are examples where you need to do, you know, some more complicated processing uh, or maybe some custom algorithm. And there are also often examples where latency matters quite a bit. Uh, some of these are, are done in a streaming um, uh, real-time fashion. So these are the, the types of things people are doing. Um, and of course, these vary a little bit by um, industry. Um, and uh, the other nice thing about, um, you know, that we found about this is uh, most users also use uh, many of Spark's uh, components and uh, basically take advantage of this unified engine. So this shows the, the most popular components used. So um, Spark SQL uh, is used uh, close to 70% of users. Uh, Data Frames, which is this new API that just came out this year, uh, is also already up at 60%. And streaming and advanced analytics machine learning and graph are both around 60% as well. Um, this is at the level of organizations. And 75% of, of the organizations use more than one component. So um, this really is the case that, uh, you know, applications usually involve a mix of these things. So uh, that's, you know, I think that that's one of the things that we're very excited to see that people actually want to do um, a mix of these things. All right, and finally, I had a few resources um, if you want to learn more about Spark. So um, if you just want to, to try playing around with Spark, you don't actually need a cluster of machines. We've designed it to be very easy to download and start with on your laptop, and you can just get it at the um, Apache website and, um, you know, and start um, running with it. Um, and uh, you, all you need is, is Java and uh, maybe Python if you want to use the Python API. So uh, that's all you need to have to run it. 
Um, if you want um, a bunch of resources on, on learning it, on the community, on, on what people are doing, um, we have a, a web page on Databricks called Spark Hub that's a community news site that aggregates a lot of these. And one of the things we have there is we also uh, created two massive online courses on Spark, one on just introduction to big data and one on large-scale machine learning. And they're both free on edX. Uh, they're, they're available, you know, they're linked from that site. And uh, uh, new versions of these courses will actually run next year. So you can uh, look there to see when these are happening and do the course, you know, with TAs and with, a, you know, with an instructor, with a, with a group of people doing it live. Um, and finally, the Spark Summit website at sparksummit.org has a lot of uh, video content and talks from the community conferences. And this is what I recommend to look at to see what people are doing um, with Spark. All the content on that is free as well. Um, so, um, you know, so you can just uh, check it out over there. So thanks, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Matei. Um, questions been popping in. Um, there's a okay. growing list Great. of questions. For, hello? Yeah. Yeah, um, so unfortunately, we probably can't get to all of them, um, but there's some pretty excellent questions now. Um, so the first okay. one is, can you explain the choice of uh, using Scala as the uh, main programming language to implement Spark in the beginning? Um, and in particular, there's two sub-questions here. One is, uh, what's the choice of a high-level JVM-based language versus C++? And the other one is, uh, would the choice of Scala create an entry barrier for early contributors to Spark? Because they have to mm -hmm. learn a new programming languages now. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so I didn't go into this too much, um, but um, um, but uh, yeah, Spark itself is mostly written in Scala, which especially when we came out, it was a you know fairly new language, um, you know, doing functional programming on the JVM. So it was definitely a you know you know kind of an interesting thing to choose. Um, so we chose Scala for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason is that we want it to be on the JVM so that we can interoperate with the Hadoop ecosystem. There were all these um, uh, you know um, storage systems like Hadoop file system, Cassandra, HBase, and so on, and file formats and libraries uh, that were on the JVM and that everyone used to work with data already. And we we wanted to be able to plug into those and just work with them. So uh, that's why we wanted to be on the JVM, to easily call into these and load data from Hadoop and so on. Um, and the second reason we chose Scala is um, it has a really nice, uh, very concise uh, um, API for passing in functions. So similar to what I showed um, before with, um, with Python, um, it basically, um, um, well, I, I don't have a code example in the slide set, but basically much like passing in those Lambda functions in Python um, that I showed before, you can pass in, um, uh, you know, a, a Scala expression and just write a function in one line. Um, so, uh, so, so that's why we chose that. Now, the, since since that came up, so there were a few uh, a few questions. So since that came up, we we added support for writing programs in other languages too, like Python and Java, and we see that those are pretty popular as well. So you don't need to know Scala to use Spark. Of course, a lot of people do use it because it's a good language, uh, uh, you know, for for this kind of programming. Um, and in terms of people contributing to the project, um, it might have created a bit of a barrier at the beginning, but I don't think we've had significant problems with that. Um, I think actually, you know, we designed the project to be approachable and easy to understand, even if you're not an expert on Scala. And we've gotten very good contributors and, and many of the contributors, including actually myself and I think most of the students at Berkeley, uh, for many of them, this was the first project they did in Scala. So it's not like they knew Scala before and, uh, you know, came in and, and had to know it to, to do this. Um, so, so far it's worked okay. Of course, it's it's always, you know, it's, it's interesting to use a kind of a newer language, but um, since we started, the trend in a lot of very mainstream languages like C Sharp and Java has moved towards more functional programming similar to what we were doing in Scala. I see. Thanks a lot for explaining that. Um, and the other one, this one you kind of hinted at it and maybe even explained it during your presentation, but the question still uh, came up uh, three or more, four times, so I picked it up again. Um, so the question is, 
how does the uh, in-memory model work for a very large amount of data that's actually maybe larger than the aggregate physical memory available on the machines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what happens then is um, you can uh, so so when you say cache in Spark, you can actually choose um, you know options for what to do when when the data doesn't fit in memory. By default, it only stores um, as much data as fits in the cache, and anything else um, it goes back and, and recomputes it each time uh, from you know from the original file, like the HDFS file underneath. Um, you can also cache data on disk, or you can say, okay, if it doesn't fit in memory, spill it out to disk, and people do that as well. Um, so the cache Caching is just a hint. It's it's not the program isn't going to stop if um, if it doesn't have enough memory. It's just a hint that if you do have memory, uh, try to cache this because I want to reuse it in the future. I see. And um, this one is also a very popular one, which is uh, what are mm -hmm. the major directions for Spark um, in 2016, and maybe the rest of uh, the two weeks in December 2015. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so um, so there are uh, a few uh, a few interesting things going on in in the project now that will um, continue. Um, so one of them is um, um, in terms of higher level API. There's this uh, new um, data set API and data frames uh, as well. Uh, and basically these these APIs um, uh, work with structured data. So if you know your records all have the same schema, um, but they're a lot more efficient efficient than just working with Java objects uh, directly because they store the data in a compact, you know, binary uh, format um, and uh, basically, you know, th they can be a lot faster as a result. Um, and um, so, so the, the, the data set API uh, and, and data frames um, are going to make it easier and easier to get very high performance code with Spark if your data is structured. And we want to make it possible to do that in as many applications as possible. Um, so we want to make a lot of the other APIs work very well with, uh, with data in this format. Um, and uh, so, so that's one of the, uh, one of the major things. As a user of Spark, the, Changes from that aren't very large, uh, but basically, um, w if you can tell the system if your data has a specific format um, and, and you tell it a little bit about that in advance, it will just store it um, more efficiently and, and run functions on it more efficiently. Uh, the second um, uh, thing that's happening uh, under the hood and that's actually related to this is uh, this thing called Project Tungsten, which is to have, um, uh, you know, more efficient physical execution. So uh, this includes working directly on binary data, which I mentioned. It also includes code generation. So when you write several different operations in Spark or if you write something like a SQL query or a data frame expression, which is a very similar thing, um, we we automatically compile it to Java code um, specialized for your data, and we run that code directly. And uh, th this, uh, you know, th this uh, this effort I, I think can um, can easily lead to let's say a five to ten uh, times improvement even in um, in a, a bunch of different applications. And it's mostly transparent to the user. You don't need to do anything special. Uh, the main reason uh, we're looking at this is basically, uh, you know. Uh, making Spark more CPU efficient. So, um, you know, over time with networks getting a little faster and solid state drives and so on, um, it, it's important to improve CPU efficiency to keep up with, uh, with the speed of uh, I.O. devices. So I'd say these are the two uh, biggest things happening. Um, there's quite a bit of other stuff in, in the libraries as well, but yeah. Thanks a lot for sharing the uh, roadmap and directions. Um, the other question is also very popular and uh, it's related to the programming languages. So Python is uh, one of the most um, popular programming languages people use. And a lot of questions about how, uh, if all they know are Python, they don't really understand Scala or Java, can they be comfortably using Spark? Are there any mm -hmm. implications in using Python? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so so we we work as uh, you know we strive as as much as possible to make um, uh, Python you know get every feature that Scala and Java get right away, and I think we've been doing a pretty good job of that. Um, 
at the beginning, there, there were some libraries that took longer to appear in Python than in, than in the other languages because they were first written in Scala and, uh, and, uh, and Java, and uh, we, were always, we always had to hide a wrapper to expose them in Python. Uh, now, the way we've designed things with uh, the, the machine learning pipelines and data frames, it's, it's actually much easier to expose any new library in Python from the beginning, and that's what we're doing with all the new ones. So at Databricks in particular, I didn't talk much about Databricks, but at Databricks, we run um, hosted, um, you know, service in the cloud that runs Spark and, and in a general big data environment for you. And um, um, Python is um, is uh, uh, very widely used uh, among our customers, and uh, many um, customers use only Python or Python and SQL, especially many that are new to Spark, and uh, you know they're able to do all the things that they um, you know that they want to do with it. I see. Um, so this one also just came up uh, quite a few times. Um, so you mentioned about the generality of Spark. So what uh, what um, applications should you not be using Spark for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Spark is is a um, is a um, analytics uh, engine. So it's it's meant to compute something on a bunch of data, either data that's static, that's sitting somewhere, or a stream that's coming in, uh, you know, in real time. Um, but Spark isn't uh, designed. Um, for transactional workloads where, you know, instead of just running an analysis on, on all the data, you're updating individual um, records, you know, sort of one at a time. So um, it's it's not something you'd use, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a storage engine for a website or as a replacement for like a memcached or something like that or for a key value store like Cassandra. It's just for running computation on data you have that's basically append only. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the biggest thing. So, uh, and that's also, you know, that's actually something you see in a lot of these uh, big data systems. They're, they're very different systems for um, transactions versus, um, uh, versus um, analytics. Um, and um, uh, other than that, um, of course, uh, it, it will fit better for applications where there are built-in libraries for the things you want. So, you know, um, uh, some things that people do in scientific computing, for example, there aren't libraries for those in Spark. So, um, so you don't. Uh, so, so that's not going to work as well. But uh, if you're doing something with, uh, say, SQL or some of the machine learning algorithms we have, uh, or just simple maps and filters and so on. Uh, uh, then uh, it's likely that you can do it. I see. Um, we haven't talked about machine learning a lot today because it's sort of a high-level overview talk. Um, but one question is, what are the uh, technical challenges um, you or the team had when porting the single no machine learning algorithms over to distributed uh, mm -hmm. versions in Spark? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So, so the first uh, challenge: a lot of algorithms um, just aren't parallel to begin with, and um, you know they, they're actually written as a sequential algorithm, and uh, it's very hard to make them parallel without actually changing the algorithm and maybe getting you know the wrong results. So um, to start with, you know, we we only picked algorithms that we know have. Um, you know a, a good parallel implementation but that's like that's one thing that sometimes is is a is a limit for people is like their favorite algorithm uh you know people don't know how to do it in parallel um luckily there's a lot of research going on now to figure out how to do the most common ones and basically in, in a lot of cases there are good um, good parallel alternatives um, the second thing uh, that's uh, you know that's challenging is just uh, managing the amount of um, of, uh, of communication and of intermediate state and so on. So you really have to think in, in the distributed setting about where is each piece of the data located. You know, are are the pieces that that are used together next to each other, or do I have to talk to a different machine? And how much am I going to communicate and so on? It can be if if in a lot of these algorithms, as I said. The computation isn't that heavy, so if uh, if you need to communicate, um, you know, as many bytes as you're computing on, sometimes that in itself is too slow. Um, so we're trying, you know, we're trying to avoid that. Um, and um, 
you know, finally, with uh, with machine learning in particular, this is not just for distributed, but in, in general, um, each time you write a new algorithm, you, you really have to make sure uh, that it's actually correct. And it's hard to debug them because they're kind of approximate algorithms. So how do you know, you know, if it's if it's really predicting something as well as it could or anything like that? So we use a whole lot of tests that compare them to very established implementations in Python and R and uh, make sure that we get the same, you know, the same answer and the same precision um, and so on. But I think these are some of the, the things that make it difficult. Yeah. On the topic of uh, machine learning, so deep learning is all the rage these days. Yeah. Um, what can you comment on deep learning uh, with respect to Spark? Yeah, definitely. So I think deep learning is um, like um, it, it, it's something that um, could could fit uh, pretty nicely in Spark. And there are actually a bunch of um, community projects that integrate Spark with deep learning libraries. So um, in um, in um, UC Berkeley, there's a research project called SparkNet, which integrates Spark with the Cafe um, deep learning library. That's a single node library, and basically it runs Cafe in parallel on every node in your Spark cluster, and it uh, it uh, combines the results from different uh, different instances of Cafe as they run, so they can share the results and uh, and get better results. And we're also looking. There are actually some uh, simple uh, neural network. Um, um, uh, a APIs in the built-in ML library as well, and we're looking at adding more of them, or at least at adding more packages like SparkNet that let you call into these. So I think with with the many libraries coming out there, it makes a lot of sense to integrate them in. Let's see, um, so maybe the last question, um, if we're running out of time. So the um, uh, there's a few people that ask about the choice of HDFS and the other data mm -hmm. sources. Spark started yeah. working primarily with the HDFS. Um, I mm -hmm. think since they've added a lot of other implementations, can you comment a little bit on what uh, so the data underlying data sources work the best with Spark? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so um, so um, the the most uh, common ones are probably HDFS and cloud storage um, uh, systems like Amazon S3 or um, you know uh, Azure's uh, Blob Storage or the Google Compute Engine uh, equivalent of that. Um, so th these are the most common ones because you just put in files, flat files, and, and you work with them. Um, other ones that we see are um, in a more like um, sort of, um, uh, say, a scientific computing type of environment. We see people just using NFS or uh, cluster file systems like um, like uh, GlusterFS and so on. Um, so those anything that has a POSIX file system interface can be used with Spark if you have one of those. And we also see a lot of key value stores. I think Cassandra is the most popular one now. And um, there, you know, your data is sitting in Cassandra, and you also want to run analytics on it. Um, so in, in Spark, we actually have a pluggable API for putting in new data sources, and there are connectors to uh, a lot of different ones, uh, you know, MongoDB, HBase, Cassandra, all these kinds of things. Um, and, um, you know, and basically uh, people can, can use a mix of them. Um, the, the engine itself doesn't, uh, doesn't care too much about uh, which one you're using. Okay, thanks a lot, Matei. I'm afraid we have uh, run out of time today. Um, I would like to thank you again, Matei, for uh, the in informative presentation and insightful answers to many of the questions. And a special thanks to each of you in the audience for taking the time to attend and participate today. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at the uh, learning.acm.org slash webinar URL. Um, which is also now shown on the slide. You can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities on uh, learning.acm.org or just acm.org. And also, um, if you have a chance, please fill out a quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers, um, which you see on your screen. Um, this is uh, Ren Oshin, and I'm just saying goodbye for now. Thanks again for joining us, and hope you'll be joining us again in the future.